Chapter 3 He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. I often went fishing up in Maine during the summer. Personally, I am very fond of strawberries and cream, but I have found that for some strange reason, fish prefer worms. So when I went fishing, I didn't think about what I wanted. I thought about what they wanted. I didn't bait the hook with strawberries and cream. Rather, I dangled a worm or a grasshopper in front of the fish and said, wouldn't you like to have that? Why not use the same common sense when fishing for people? That is what Lloyd George, Great Britain's Prime Minister during World War I did. When someone asked him how he managed to stay in power after the other wartime leaders, Wilson, Orlando and Clemenceau, had been forgotten. He replied that if his staying on top might be attributed to any one thing, it would be to his having learned that it was necessary to bait the hook to suit the fish. Why talk about what we want? That is childish. Absurd. Of course, you are interested in what you want. You are eternally interested in it, but no one else is. The rest of us are just like you. We are interested in what we want. So the only way on earth to influence other people is to talk about what they want and show them how to get it. Remember that tomorrow when you are trying to get somebody to do something, if, for example, you don't want your children to smoke, don't preach at them and don't talk about what you want, but show them that cigarettes may keep them from making the basketball team or winning the 100-yard dash. This is a good thing to remember regardless of whether you are dealing with children or calves or chimpanzees. For example, one day, Ralph Waldo Emerson and his son tried to get a calf into the barn. They made the common mistake of thinking only of what they wanted. Emerson pushed and his son pulled, but the calf was doing just what they were doing. He was thinking only of what he wanted, so he stiffened his legs and stubbornly refused to leave the pasture. The Irish housemaid saw their predicament. She couldn't write essays and books, but on this occasion at least, she had more horse sense or calf sense than Emerson had. She thought of what the calf wanted. So she put her maternal finger in the calf's mouth and let the calf suck her finger as she gently led him into the barn. Every act you have ever performed since the day you were born was performed because you wanted something. How about the time you gave a large contribution to the Red Cross? Yes, that is no exception to the rule. You gave the Red Cross the donation because you wanted to lend a helping hand. You wanted to do a beautiful, unselfish, divine act. Inasmuch as ye have done it, unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. If you hadn't wanted that feeling more than you wanted your money, you would not have made the contribution. Of course, you might have made the contribution because you were ashamed to refuse or because a customer asked you to do it. But one thing is certain, you made the contribution because you wanted something. Harry A. Overstreet, in his illuminating book, Influencing Human Behavior, said, Action springs out of what we fundamentally desire, and the best piece of advice which can be given to would-be persuaders, whether in business, in the home, in the school, in politics, is, first, arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Andrew Carnegie, the poverty-stricken Scotch lad who had started to work at two cents an hour and finally gave away, $365 million learned early in life that the only way to influence people is to talk in terms of what the other person wants. He attended school only four years, yet he learned how to handle people. To illustrate, his sister-in-law was worried sick over her two boys. They were at Yale and they were so busy with their own affairs that they neglected to write home and paid no attention whatever to their mother's frantic letters. Then. Carnegie offered to wager a hundred dollars that he could get an answer by return mail, without even asking for it. Someone called his bet, so he wrote his nephews a chatty letter mentioning casually in a postscript that he was sending each one a five dollar bill. He neglected, however, to enclose the money. Back came replies by return mail thanking dear Uncle Andrew for his kind note and you can finish the sentence yourself. Another example of persuading comes from Stan Novak of Cleveland, Ohio, a participant in our course. Stan came home from work one evening to find his youngest son, Tim, 
kicking and screaming on the living room floor. He was to start kindergarten the next day and was protesting that he would not go. Stan's normal reaction would have been to banish the child to his room and tell him he'd just better make up his mind to go. He had no choice. But tonight, recognizing that this would not really help him start kindergarten in the best frame of mind, Stan sat down and thought, If I were Tim, why would I be excited about going to kindergarten? He and his wife made a list of all the fun things that Tim would do such as finger painting, singing songs, making new friends. Then, they put them into action. We all started finger painting on the kitchen table. My wife, Lil, my other son Bob and myself all having fun. Soon, Tim was peeping around the corner. Next, he was begging to participate. Oh no, you have to go to kindergarten first to learn how to finger paint. With all the enthusiasm I could muster, I went through the list talking in terms he could understand, telling him all the fun he would have in kindergarten. The next morning, I thought I was the first one up. I went downstairs and found Tim sitting sound asleep in the living room chair. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm waiting to go to kindergarten. I don't want to be late. The enthusiasm of our entire family had aroused in Tim an eager want that no amount of discussion or threat could have possibly accomplished. Tomorrow, you may want to persuade somebody to do something. Before you speak, pause and ask yourself, how can I make this person want to do it? That question will stop us from rushing into a situation heedlessly with futile chatter about our desires. At one time, I rented the grand ballroom of a certain New York hotel for 20 nights in each season in order to hold a series of lectures. At the beginning of one season, I was suddenly informed that I should have to pay almost three times as much rent as formerly. This news reached me after tickets had been printed and distributed and all announcements had been made. Naturally, I didn't want to pay the increase, but what was the use of talking to the hotel about what I wanted? They were interested only in what they wanted. So a couple of days later, I went to see the manager. I was a bit shocked when I got your letter, I said, but I don't blame you at all. If I had been in your position, I should probably have written a similar letter myself. Your duty as the manager of the hotel is to make all the profit possible. If you don't do that, you will be fired and you ought to be fired. Now let's take a piece of paper and write down the advantages and the disadvantages that will accrue to you if you insist on this increase in rent. Then I took a letter head and ran a line through the center and headed one column. Advantages and the other column, disadvantages. I wrote down under the head, advantages, these words, ballroom free. Then I went on to say, you will have the advantage of having the ballroom free to rent for dances and conventions. That is a big advantage. For affairs like that will pay you much more than you can get for a series of lectures. If I tie your ballroom up for 20 nights during the course of the season, it is sure to mean a loss of some very profitable business to you. Now, let's consider the disadvantages. First, instead of increasing your income from me, you are going to decrease it. In fact, you are going to wipe it out because I cannot pay the rent you are asking. I shall be forced to hold these lectures at some other place. There is another disadvantage to you also. These lectures attract crowds of educated and cultured people to your hotel. That is good advertising for you, isn't it? In fact, if you spend $5,000 advertising in the newspapers, you can bring as many people to look at your hotel as I can bring by these lectures. That is worth a lot to a hotel, isn't it? As I talked, I wrote these two disadvantages under the proper heading and handed the sheet of paper to the manager saying, I wish you would carefully consider both the advantages and disadvantages that are going to accrue to you and then give me your final decision. I received a letter the next day informing me that my rent would be increased only 50% instead of 300%. Mind you, I got this reduction without saying a word about what I wanted. I talked all the time about what the other person wanted and how he could get it. Suppose I had done the human, natural thing. Suppose I had stormed into his office and said, What do you mean by raising my rent 300%? When you know the tickets have been printed and the announcements made. 300%? Ridiculous. Absurd. I won't pay it. What would have happened then? An argument would have begun to steam and boil and sputter and you know how arguments end. Even if I had convinced him that he was wrong, his pride would have made it difficult for him to go back down and give in. Here is one of the best bits of advice ever given about the fine art of human relationships. 
If there is any one secret of success, said Henry Ford, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. That is so good. I want to repeat it. If there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. That is so simple, so obvious that anyone ought to see the truth of it at a glance. Yet, 90% of the people on this earth ignore it 90% of the time. An example, look at the letters that come across your desk tomorrow morning and you will find that most of them violate this important canon of common sense. Take this one, a letter written by the head of the radio department of an advertising agency with offices scattered across the continent. This letter was sent to the managers of local radio stations throughout the country. I have set down in brackets my reactions to each paragraph. Mr. John Blank, Blankville, Indiana. Dear Mr. Bank, the company desires to retain its position in advertising agency leadership in the radio field. Who cares what your company desires? I am worried about my own problems. The bank is foreclosing the mortgage on my house. The bugs are destroying the hollyhocks. Stock market tumbled yesterday. I missed the 8.15 this morning. I wasn't invited to the Jones dance last night. The doctor tells me I have high blood pressure and neuritis and dandruff. And then what happens? I come down to the office this morning worried, open my mail, and here is some little whippersnapper off in New York yapping about what his company wants. Bah! If he only realized what sort of impression his letter makes, he would get out of the advertising business and start manufacturing sheep dip. This agency's national advertising accounts were the bulwark of the network. Our subsequent clearances of station time have kept us at the top of agencies year after year. You are big and rich and right at the top, are you? So what? I don't give two whoops in Hades if you are as big as General Motors and General Electric and the General Staff of the US Army all combined. If you had as much sense as a half-witted hummingbird, you would realize that I am interested in how big I am, not how big you are. All this talk about your enormous success makes me feel small and unimportant. We desire to service our accounts with the last word on radio station information. You desire. You desire. You unmitigated ass. I am not interested in what you desire or what the President of the United States desires. Let me tell you once and for all that I am interested in what I desire. And you haven't said a word about that yet in this absurd letter of yours. Will you therefore put the company on your preferred list for weekly station information? Every single detail that will be useful to an agency in intelligently booking time. Preferred list? You have your no. You make me feel insignificant by your big talk about your company. Then you ask me to put you on a preferred list. And you don't even say please when you ask it. A prompt acknowledgement of this letter giving us your latest doings will be mutually helpful. You fool. You mail me a cheap form letter. A letter scattered far and wide like the autumn leaves and you have the gal to ask me when I am worried about the mortgage and the hollyhocks and my blood pressure to sit down and dictate a personal note acknowledging your form letter and you ask me to do it promptly. What do you mean promptly? Don't you know I am just as busy as you are or at least I like to think I am. And while we are on the subject, who gave you the lordly right to order me around? You say it will be mutually helpful. At last, at last. You have begun to see my viewpoint, but you are vague about how it will be to my advantage. Very truly yours, John Doe, Manager Radio Department. P.S. The enclosed reprint from the Blankville Journal will be of interest to you, and you may want to broadcast it over your station. Finally, down here in the postscript, you mentioned something that may help me solve one of my problems. Why didn't you begin your letter with, but what's the use? Any advertising man who is guilty of perpetrating such drivel as you have sent me is something wrong with his medulla oblongata. You don't need a letter giving our latest doings. What you need is a quart of iodine in your thyroid gland. Now, if people who devote their lives to advertising and who pose as experts in the art of influencing people to buy, if they write a letter like that, what can we expect from the butcher and baker or the auto mechanic? 
Here is another letter written by the superintendent of a large freight terminal to a student of this course, Edward Vermillion. What effect did this letter have on the man to whom it was addressed? Read it and then I'll tell you. A. Zerega's Sons Incorporated, 28 Front Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11201. Attention, Mr. Edward Vermillion. Gentlemen, the operations at our outbound rail receiving station are handicapped because a material percentage of the total business is delivered us in the late afternoon. This condition results in congestion, overtime on the part of our forces, delays to trucks and in some cases delays to freight. On November 10, we received from your company a lot of 510 pieces, which reached here at 4.20 p.m. We solicit your cooperation towards overcoming the undesirable effects arising from late receipt of freight. May we ask that, on days on which you ship the volume which was received on the above date, effort be made either to get the truck here earlier or to deliver us part of the freight during the morning. The advantage that would accrue to you under such an arrangement would be that of more expeditious discharge of your trucks and the assurance that your business would go forward on the date of its receipt. Very truly yours, J.B. Superintendent. After reading this letter, Mr. Vermillion, sales manager for A. Zerega's Son Incorporated, sent it to me with the following comment. This letter had the reverse effect from that which was intended. The letter begins by describing the terminal's difficulties, in which we are not interested, generally speaking. Our cooperation is then requested without any thought as to whether it would inconvenience us. And then, finally, in the last paragraph, the fact is mentioned that if we do cooperate, it will mean more expeditious discharge of our trucks with the assurance that our freight will go forward on the date of its receipt. In other words, that in which we are most interested is mentioned last. And the whole effect is one of raising a spirit of antagonism rather than of cooperation. Let's see if we can't rewrite and improve this letter. Let's not waste any time talking about our problems. As Henry Ford admonishes, let's get the other person's point of view and see things from his or her angle, as well as from our own. Here is one way of revising the letter. It may not be the best way. But isn't it an improvement? Mr. Edward Vermillion, A. Zerega's Sons Incorporated, 28 Front Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11201. Dear Mr. Vermillion, Your company has been one of our good customers for 14 years. Naturally, we are very grateful for your patronage and are eager to give you the speedy, efficient service you deserve. However, we regret to say that it isn't possible for us to do that when your trucks bring us a large shipment late in the afternoon, as they did on November 10. Why? Because many other customers make late afternoon deliveries also. Naturally, th that causes congestion. That means your trucks are held up unavoidably at the pier and sometimes even your freight is delayed. That's bad, but it can be avoided. If you make your deliveries at the pier in the morning when possible, your trucks will be able to keep moving. Your freight will get immediate attention and our workers will get home early at night to enjoy a dinner of the delicious macaroni and noodles that you manufacture. Regardless of when your shipments arrive, we shall always cheerfully do all in our power to serve you promptly. You are busy. Please don't trouble to answer this note. Yours truly, JB Superintendent.